Hi there, and welcome to the Nerds of Business podcast. My name is Darren Moffat. I'm a director at WebBuzz, the growth marketing agency, and I'm your host. It's great to have you with us for episode two of season two on the theme of product development. Now, if you're new to this podcast, our vision is to make entrepreneurs happier by solving the key challenges that all businesses must overcome one problem at a time. In the previous episode, we looked at the challenge of product ideation. We revealed how design thinking and product development frameworks are used by corporations and design gurus to develop those billion-dollar business ideas that literally change markets and make careers seemingly overnight. The notion that all you need is a powerful idea is seductive. But of course, it's a fantasy. The reality is is that ideation is just the beginning of a long, often arduous journey towards a fully developed product that the market might actually want. Arguably, the real work starts with the next stage in the development process, product validation. You'd expect that big brands with plenty of resources would be careful to get this step right, but it often doesn't work that way. For one reason or another, even the most successful companies are sometimes guilty of launching terrible products that sounded like a good idea at the time. And as we're about to hear in our opening story, the entertainment industry is no exception. The year is 1981. Raiders of the Lost Ark is a massive box office smash at the movies. Its success with young audiences has given the famous director Steven Spielberg an idea for a new product. His theory is that movies can cross over to become a hit in the burgeoning market of video games. To test this hypothesis, he partners with a small silicon tech startup called Atari. The company gives the task of coding the game to a young prodigy called Howard Scott Warshaw. It takes him 10 months to design the Raiders game, write the code, get user feedback, validate the concept, and put it through quality control. When it's finished, Warshaw shows the game to Spielberg. He loves it, and he pays Warshaw the ultimate compliment by saying that the game is just like being in the movie. The product is then released as a game for the Atari 2600 console and it's a commercial success. But this is where the real trouble begins. It's now July 1982 and Steven Spielberg has another big movie scheduled for release in Christmas of that year. E.T. is the story of a cute alien lost on Earth and trying to get back to his family. After negotiating a license fee equivalent to $53 million in today's money, Steven Spielberg demands that Atari put the young Warshaw on the E.T. project to again work his coding magic. But the extensive legal delays between Atari and Spielberg's production company mean that this time Warshaw has just 36 hours to devise a game concept. To make matters worse, he's given only five weeks to code the entire game so that the product can be manufactured and shipped to retailers in time for the Christmas movie release. Although initial sales are strong on the back of enthusiasm for the film, it soon becomes clear that the Atari ET video game is a Christmas turkey. The game concept has no real relationship to the film plot, and users find it confusing to play because of a weird six-sided world that keeps returning players to the same screen again and again without explanation. The game soon receives a stream of harshly negative reviews and sales quickly dry up. Retailers demand an official return program for all the unsold stock and it ultimately leads to the end of the Atari 26 console as a viable product. In September 1983, The Alamogordo Daily News reports that between 10 and 20 semi-trailer truckloads of Atari boxes, cartridges and systems from an Atari storehouse in El Paso, Texas have been crushed and buried at the landfill in the city limits and then covered with concrete. 
This forever dooms the legacy of the E.T. game, which goes on to become universally regarded as the worst video game in history. And it's all arguably because they ran out of time and failed to undertake any product validation. E.T. Phone Home. Now, there are a few really interesting footnotes to the E.T. game story. The first is that the burial of the E.T. cartridges was the basis for a film. In 2014, an independent science fiction comedy called Angry Video Game Nerd, the movie, was released. Now, I'm not making this up. You can actually read all about it on Wikipedia. It even featured the game designer himself. And that brings us to the second footnote. What actually happened to the young Howard Scott Warshaw? Well, many years later, after stints in real estate and computers, he's made his name as the Silicon Valley therapist. He now tends to the bruised psyches and fragile egos of tech leaders, which goes to show that there's a big market of stressed, burnt-out startup founders out there. Now, I'll bet that one of the main causes of this stress is a failure to properly validate product ideas. I know this from personal experience. In 2013, my partner and I launched a social networking site for Neighbours. Now, we quickly got mainstream media coverage and attracted thousands of users. We thought we were on the way to success. But in fact, because our validation was poor, we were just beginning a very frustrating journey into failure. Now, ultimately, our story ended well. We took our learnings from the startup and pivoted to a growth agency model that's still going strong today but only after we burnt some serious cash and put close personal relationships under real strain. So if you're thinking of doing a startup or creating a new product, what can you do to properly validate and avoid the pain of a poorly conceived idea that no one wants? I love data. I I love kind of looking through the data. You need to have systems, you need to have structure. You're going to get chopped to pieces. Enthusiasm is unstoppable. We kind of hit a point where we were like, we need another lever. Surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and richer than you. (laughs) This is Nerds of Business. We'll start the show in a minute, but first, a word from our sponsor. Hi everyone, it's Ben Carew here. I'm a director at WebBuzz, the growth marketing agency. I work alongside the host of this podcast, Darren Moffat. If you're a business owner who wants to grow, but you don't have the spare funds to invest in marketing right now, you're not alone. Since COVID hit, we've noticed more clients suspending campaigns or delaying their marketing altogether due to cash flow issues. In response to this, we developed a solution called Buy Now, Pay Later Digital Marketing. It provides eligible small businesses with nothing to pay on SEO, digital marketing and website development for up to three months. We think it's perfect for entrepreneurs who need a helping hand getting sales flowing again. I'll be back later in the show to explain how it works, but if you can't wait, you can download a free info pack now at webbuzz.com.au slash bnpl. That stands for buy now, pay later. That's webbuzz.com.au slash bnpl. So the title of today's episode and the problem we're trying to solve is how to validate your product idea and avoid creating a money pit that destroys your life. It's a really important topic today and we've got some truly inspiring guests on the show. You'll hear from a Norwegian bar baron, a prop tech founder who's worked for Uber and Google, and we'll completely nerd out with our two product design experts. And stay tuned for our feature story with the founders of Acoustic Sheep. They're electronic hardware manufacturers who have sold over 1 million units globally of their hip product, sleep phones. Here's a sneak peek. Yeah, it, it was kind of a blue ocean uh, thing where we just landed on a, on a category that nobody's tapped into, you know, it, it's, 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 it's definitely a niche. And we've discovered that kind of the hard way over the years. But first, 
Here's just a quick reminder that if you're enjoying Nerd to Business, to please hit the subscribe button on your podcast player. It means you'll automatically receive each new episode every fortnight, and it makes it easier for us to stay in touch. When it comes to product validation, I think a good place to start is a technical explanation of the concept. For this, I turn to Carrie Peters. Carrie is one of our two product design experts for this series. She's product design principal at Sydney agency US2, originally from Oregon via New York, where she's designed for the likes of Nike and ClassPass. She's now a leading exponent of human-centered design. I began by asking her, what exactly is product validation? Um, product validation is basically, um, at its essence, it's just finding ways to test our assumptions about ideas and concepts so that two different things can happen. Either one, we gain a lot of confidence that yes, this thing that I thought was a winner is in fact going to be the best thing ever. Or um, two, you fail really quickly um, in a sort of safe environment um, before it's actually in the hands of your intended users or out in the world. Because if you wait till then to find out if it's going to work, um, you probably won't make it. If you find out early, you can iterate sooner and then you can potentially make that concept even better. Now, that is, for our listeners, I might just sort of bold and highlight this particular <laughs> section uh, sort of in a, in a sonic way. Um, failing fast, that's obviously an established yes. concept in sort of lean methodologies and startup yep. land. Yep. Um, and this is a mistake that I've seen quite a few people make. It's a very common mistake. I'm sure yes. you've – sounds like you've seen it yourself. Yes. Yep. Oh, I've participated in it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. It's hard because I know what it's like. You come up with this idea, right, and you just – you've talked to a few people and people build onto it and you get really excited. And I, I've done this. Like I've done this with ideas um, and even started to design things up. But I think the thing that um, – that these processes and, and training yourself in them and, and – um, putting them in your toolkit give you is they they help you remember that ideas and products or services um, they don't live alone siloed they live once they launch they live amongst many systems around other products um, and in environments and contexts that you may not have thought about um, so you know we design and think about things and and are imagining the ideal situation, but in reality, a good product is one that is, can be used in the worst of situations, right? Um, so that's essentially what you want to try and um, you want to try and simulate, you know, those situations. And so, in order to do that, um, there's a few different things you can do. I think there's this framework that's really helpful. Um, it's basically like the sweet spot of innovation. And they, there's these three lenses. I'm sure you've seen it before. Um, the three lenses of uh, usability or desirability, which is basically um, what people want um, and can or will use. There's feasibility, which is the um, the materials and tools that we have to make it. And then there's viability, which is about how the business model and the value exchanges between the different people that are, are using the product um, if they're enough to make it sustainable. So these three lenses, um, feasibility, viability, and usability, we look at those three things um, and we have assumptions across all of them. So we do this thing called assumptions mapping. You write down basically all your assumptions across all those those things, you know, um, what you assume users will do, what you assume the, the technology is capable of, and then what you assume will make a, um, a sustainable business. You write those up all up um, on Post-its, and then we just do a simple matrix with two different axes. Um, one axis is risk, low risk to high risk, and then uh, the other is known to unknown. And basically what you'll find is... Um, there will be assumptions that would be high risk, um, like, for instance, walking across the street. It's very high risk if there's a car coming, right? But if you're walking across the street on a crosswalk, um, you kind of know that you're not going to get hit because there's rules of the road that you can kind of trust people are going to follow and that you probably won't die. Mm -hmm. um, but there might be an assumption um, that's both high risk, so you're walking across the street again, but not on a cross crosswalk. You don't know if that car is going to slow down. You don't know if they don't see you. They aren't expecting to slow down because there's no road signs to kind of tell them that. So you, in that case, you've got a high risk and really unknown situation. And it's those types of assumptions about your product that you want to go out and um, experiment on. So you'll set up experiments then 
to see if you can validate or invalidate or gain confidence in those things um, that are those high risk unknown items in that quadrant? Well, that is uh, wonderfully, again, wonderfully nerdy. And I, and I love that. <laughs> that was a great, uh, really great visual example as well. Mm. Thanks for that, because I think that really paints a picture for listeners that, mm. you know, essentially what we're talking about here, uh, another way to perhaps just des- describe what, what it is that you and your colleagues do, it's, it, it, it's almost like a, a um, and I use this term very affectionately, a mad scientist uh, experiment in the real world. Yeah. Uh, would, would you say that's a fair call? A Absolutely, yeah. yeah, which is also called efficacy sometimes. It's not about um, uh, if it's effective, if the thing would work in, an, in, a, in a silo. It's about, like, does it work in the real world? If you, you know, throw it up against the wall, does it have, do people have efficacy with it? Can they actually use it in those situations? So that's what validating a product is. But how does it work? Ross Gales is a director of design and strategy at Sydney agency Pollen. Ross has designed product solutions for some of the biggest brands in Australia, including Gumtree, which is owned by global giant eBay. And Ross, of course, is the second of our product design experts for this series. I asked him, from a technical perspective, what are the key processes that entrepreneurs can use to successfully validate their product idea? Yeah, so look, building a, a new product is a, is a massive learning process for anyone. And I think the biggest tip I can, can give anybody is just to think lean, particularly for a new business idea. It, it really is um, a, a lot of time and energy can be wasted very quickly um, if we're not thinking lean. What do I need to do to get to the next stage? And it's about doing just enough to get the right learnings in order to progress Lots of people talk about lean methodology, and it, but it's really quite simple. It's 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 keep it simple, stupid. It's the kiss principle. Yep. Yeah. So so I think the the lots of people bandy around words like the MVP or the MMP. That's nerdy. Now that's 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 super nerdy, Ross. Um, I know what MVP is, but you might like to explain that for our listeners. Yeah. So so look, an MVP is a minimum viable product, mm-hmm. and I think that word viable is the problem that I've got with an MVP framework. So, so for something to be viable, it just needs to function. Yep. Yeah. It's to do the bare minimum, and yes, that aligns with my lean sort of methodologies. Mm-hmm. But what I what I'm more of an advocate for, and 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 without sort of getting too jargonistic about it, is is the MMP or the minimum marketable product. Ah. And the reason I like that term is that it's about something that's worth talking about. Mm-hmm. And if you're taking a new product to market, it's one thing for it to function. That's the MVP. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for it to deliver the types of value that are worth talking about. That's where things start to get a bit more interesting and give you something a bit more tangible to use in a conversation with your customers and really start to build that relationship and deliver value to them. Mm-hmm. So even at the early stages, I, I, I suggest to our clients, do the MVP, do all the must-have features that the platform needs to function. Find some things that are worth talking about. Definitely invest in building something that's going to be a real value driver for your users. And lastly, look, a framework that I, I talk a lot, a lot about when validating product ideas, um, I'm a big advocate for inclusive design. And I think this is a, a really big topic, um, probably too big to unpack in, the, in this session. Yep. Um, but it's really about ensuring that nobody gets left behind by your design. Okay. And I think a lot of small companies, and particularly in startup world, invest in doing just enough, but with a very small lens of who the user is. And without thinking more broadly about what are the different requirements, particularly in a multicultural country like, like Australia, um, of, of how do we address people um, in, in different languages, mm-hmm. with different sort of cultural understandings, different literacy levels. Just really understanding it because one, one of the things I advocate for is the, the growth potential in, in making sure that all people are included in the platform. People see it as being a bit of a accessibility edge case. It's a small audience. It's not. Mm. It really is about making sure that everybody gets access to the same tools and services and can have the same experience. So the principle of inclusive design, as you've just outlined there, obviously makes a lot of sense. And when you when you consider a couple of facts, you might already be aware of this, but one, you know, the, some of the major newspapers, like the Daily Telegraph, for instance, they're on public record as saying that they... The writing in that publication is pitched at the functional literacy level of a 14-year-old yeah. because that is what that is the actual average for the older demographic. Absolutely. For the younger demographic, it's better. 
But for the older demographic who are buying the papers, that's the level it has to be pitched at. And so these kind of issues must open up lots of challenges for designers because, um, you know, it's not a monocultural society anymore as it once was. You've got these educational and, and uh, sort of literacy uh, constraints. And um, to illustrate my point, um, I noticed uh, there's a famous um, recent advertising campaign by Bank West where they've gone digital. It's an, The character morphs into an avatar. And, you know, I think that's partly because of the society and the age we live in now. Like, you've got to be a blank canvas. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, how, how that must be hard to kind of aggregate all of that fragmentation in the de- in the demographics and the psychographics of, of the market. Yeah, look, it sure is, and I think there's some there's some basic principles in in the way you design and build a product mm-hmm. that ensure that that most needs are being met, and and they can be things about as you say, um, ensuring the literacy levels right for your for your audience. Mm-hmm. So if it's particularly in in financial services, you want to make sure that everybody's got access to the financial products that you're you're building. So so writing to and 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 I agree with the fourteen year old or the the year nine student is the right demographic. There's some statistic, I believe it's over 50% of Australians actually have a literacy level l- lower than year nine. Yep. Um, so that's that's a big, big chunk of the audience of people who may miss out on pertinent information um, if it's not articulated in the right way. Mm-hmm. But older audiences, um, you know, things like um, the design, high contrast ratios in your design, ensuring your font size is legible. These are just simple design decisions that you can make to ensure that everybody's included and, and, and can access and use the platform. And now for the entrepreneur perspective, Meena Radhakrishnan is the founder and CEO of proptechdifferent.com.au. Meena herself has a design background and was a product designer for Google and also for Uber when they had just 20 employees. Meena has brought design thinking to the problem of property management. So she's trying to make that less painful for investors by creating a platform that manages properties for just $100 per month. Different has raised over $13 million in capital so far from the likes of leading VC firm Squarepeg Capital. I asked Mina what she did to validate the underlying value proposition of her product and what she shares has value for all business owners. Yeah. You know, actually, I think the validation comes before you even start building a product. So one of the things that we did is um, <laughs> neither my husband or our designers, but we like pulled together as our rusty skills and some mix of like, you know, online work and stuff. And we ran Facebook ads. We ran Facebook ads with absolutely nothing. We just said, hey, like, here's the here's the here's the idea. What you do is what you do. And like, so we, we ran it to see like, what what do people click on? Well, like, do we get emails? Can we get phone numbers? Like, what is this something that people actually want? Not a single developer, nothing else. It was just the two of us are trying to figure out like putting together like the prettiest ads we could make and, um, and actually putting them on people in Facebook and you can kind of, and you can do this, you can validate this for like a few hundred dollars. Yep. And then we just have this slightly more success. And, and after we got like a whole bunch of emails and phone numbers, we're like, okay, this feels like something that people are willing to do. And that's the point at which we actually started investing and in doing anything with regards to building a product, building a company, kind of defining the rest of it. Um, and, and I think that that's really important is like, you have to start, small, right? Like there's no point in building when you don't even know if you want to do the stuff, right? Like, um, I think the, the phrase that I've heard around this is, um, there's a, there's, there, there's a gap in the market, but is there a market in the gap? And uh, that's the question that you have to solve for first. That's a good one. I, like, I haven't heard that one before. That's great. And you're quite right. I mean, it's a very common mistake that uh, first time entrepreneurs make mm-hmm. is they go out and build this massive machine or sort of you know complex platform and what have you and they haven't really successfully or properly validated the idea and of course when you get to, if you take that approach untangling that is becomes a very costly exercise so um, no that's that's a great insight that you shared there thank you but in some industries it can be difficult or even impossible to fully validate a new product idea hacks and workarounds are sometimes the only option Hospitality is a great example. How can you test a market for a new bar or restaurant experience without investing millions on the venue and the fit out in the first place? Sven Amening is the founder and CEO of the Speak Easy Group. They're a hospitality business with eight venues across Australia. 
Sven is originally from Norway and he brings a real product design ethos to the service industry. And he recently launched a unique Viking-inspired restaurant called Munya. I asked Sven what approach to product validation he uses for his venues and his answer is literally unforgettable. At no point did we sit down and go, well, Viking seems to be coming into trend with the show and Game of Thrones plays off Vikings. Maybe there's an opportunity, F&B space, to take advantage of this emerging trend of, of Vikings. Mm. That was not something we ever did. Um, and we never thought it was going to be as popular as it was because when I came up with the idea, everyone thought it was weird. You know? Everyone thought it was weird. Okay, yeah. so that's so interesting. And, and that leads me to the next question, like, what did you do to validate the idea? Okay, so how did you test the market? Was there any kind of process or framework in place to validate the idea or did you really just go on gut instinct? You know, it's just like we're, we're going to run with this because I'm, I'm loving the idea myself. Yes, yeah, so I've got a business partner who I work with and we have developed um, a singular question that has to be answered for us to do it. Obviously, we will also do the financial forecasting and make sure it makes sense financially. But um, – uh, it's just a singular question. Is it a f- yeah? If it's not a f- yeah, we're not going to do it. I'm loving that. <laughs> I, I, I can't tell you how much I love that. I mean, that is, you know, <laughs> that is like hands down one of the best things I've ever heard a, an entrepreneur say. Like, so it, there was no real validation other than you guys have an internal um, – kind of a question that you ask yourself and if if a concept becomes so compelling to you guys as, as business partners that it's a f- yeah then you do it yeah then we do it. yeah and if it's a, if it's anything else then we just wait for another moment that's going to give us that yeah, there's no yeah. point going out doing something we are kind of into right okay well uh listeners you heard it here first um uh, sven's um sort of a trademark approach to product development is the f- yeah process and, um, yeah, we, we, we endorse that here at Nerds of Business. And now for our feature story. Acoustic Sheep is an electronics company based in Pennsylvania in the U.S. It was founded in 2007 by Dr. Wei Xin Lai, a family physician, and her husband, Jason Wolf, who was a video game developer. Now, Dr. Lai struggled with getting back to sleep after patient phone calls in the middle of the night. And she needed to listen to some meditative music to help her relax. But headphones were bulky and earbuds were uncomfortable. Since there were no headphones specifically designed for sleeping on the market, they invented their own. The product is called Sleep Phones and they've sold over 1 million units. It's a brilliant product. Listen to their fascinating entrepreneurial journey from the initial ideation phase all the way through and beyond product validation. Uh, Firstly, I'd like to... Uh, welcome uh, the two founders, uh, uh, husband and wife team, Dr. Wei Xin Lai and Jason Wolf. Uh, welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to have you with us. Um, so, um, look, for those listeners hearing about sleep phones uh, for the first time, I think we might just start with, you know, let's paint a picture for the for the product. Describe to our listeners uh, what the product is, and then we'll, we'll get into the genesis and how, how you put it all together. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and they're super soft. So they're unlike any other headphones out there because they're, they're just soft and, uh, they look more like a headband than headphones. That's right. So um, for the listeners that are coming to this, yeah. uh, sort of just with audio only no video, um, the, it's the, this, this product is essentially, it looks like, um, a sweatband from the Jane Fonda, uh, aerobic videos of of the of the nineteen eighties. It's very groovy, nicely designed, um, but it, but in fact, uh, there are headphones inside the band. Yeah. Yes, uh, and and then there are speakers that are very very thin mm-hmm. um, and flexible. Uh, and then here we have uh, a Bluetooth module that's also thin and flexible with uh, with a battery and the Bluetooth receptor and all of that kind of stuff. You barely know what's there. The, the key word is comfort. Comfort, yeah. Uh, no, look, it's, it's a fabulous, a fabulous product, and it's one of those products that you you know 
when I first came across it, I was like, oh, well, of course, of course, someone has put, has done that. Why, why didn't I think of that? You know? Uh, so it's I'm like really, and, and, and like all the best products, you know, they seem obvious in hindsight. Yeah. Uh, but I'm really keen uh, to hear about the whole Genesis story, you know, like how, because um, um, Dr. Lai, you're, you're obviously a qualified uh, doctor. You were practicing um, a general practitioner, I think. Um, and um, so you've, you've then pivoted into becoming, you know, an entrepreneur and you've got a very successful business now. So I'm really keen to hear the Genesis story, how this all came about and um, yeah. And how you actually came up or discovered the product concept. Uh, so as a doctor, I was getting phone calls late at night from patients. Uh, and at 3 a.m. when they would call, then it would be hard for me to get back to sleep. Um, and, and you know, and my mind would be racing. And my uh, Jason here uh, recommended that I listen to some relaxing music. So he found me all kinds of songs with binaural beats, which are specialized tones that are supposed to kind of help my brain relax. And so I thought, great, sure, I'll give it a try. But then, you know, I tried headphones and they're bulky and you can't sleep on your side. And then I tried earbuds and they just poke into my ears and they hurt. Um, and so then uh, we sat down uh, night after night and just hammered out some prototypes. Um, first, we had kind of an uh, idea of uh, putting speakers inside of like a fabric made uh, headphone, traditional headphone. Uh, with cans and stuff, but but it was all made out of fabric. But that didn't really hold very well. It didn't stay on my head. Have and, to keep it on. Yeah. yeah um, and we just used like different wires around the house and stuff to to make our prototypes. But uh, eventually, we came up with the idea of speakers inside of a headband. And when you know, I, I made one, stitched one together, and put it on, and tried it. It stayed on all night. It was super comfortable. Uh, it dawned on us that, you know, hey, this is really interesting. Uh, well, you know, first we, we looked all over the internet and there was nothing. Um, this was now back in 2007. So, you know, the internet wasn't as broad as it is now, uh, but there was still nothing. Uh, Amazon was already around. There was nothing there. There was nothing on Alibaba, nothing like that. And so we, we basically had to come up with our own solution and, and this was it. Yeah, so it, it's that really that is set that sort of classic entrepreneurial moment of discovery you know you had a problem uh you 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 want you needed to solve it and you couldn't find a product to solve it so you had to actually make one yourself yeah so um so you, you, i mean it's and here you are all these years later you've got a, a really thriving business so um you know what research did you do to confirm the market opportunity like i you, you talked a little bit about there about how you, you know, you made your prototype, and I want to I'll get onto that in a minute in more detail. But you know, when it seemed like oh, there's something here, um, you know, how did you validate the idea? So our, our approach at the time it really wasn't so sophisticated as, as how you know we might do it now or everybody might do it now. But it, just the whole thing was was very much driven by you know a little bit of lateral thinking, but. Uh, just definite personal need right and we really felt that need and and we as soon as we made it available to others they showed interest and so so it was was that that personal need that lateral thinking and um and just just the validation of showing it to others was a big deal but i think also like luck was a big part of it that, that we did happen to find something that that really came together you know from all those three sources yeah, it, it was kind of a blue ocean uh, a thing where we just landed on a on a category that nobody tapped into. You know, it, it's 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 definitely a niche, and we've discovered that kind of the hard way over the years because we thought, well, everybody sleeps, so 100 percent of people might be interested, right? And that's not necessarily the case. It is a niche, and perhaps because we did not do any market validation or research, um, and and you know, it was born out of a need for just me. <laughs> um, so we didn't really, you know, anticipate on needing any of that kind of stuff. We, we just kind of winged it and we put it out there. And then that's what told us that, you know, this was a viable product. Um, you know, we made the first 500 pieces ourselves. Uh, we, we didn't spend really any money. Uh, we, we didn't 
go into debt. We didn't have to have a startup fund or anything like that. We just, you know, spent maybe twenty dollars here or there buying a few parts from Radio Shack and put it together. And you know, we saw it as entertainment. I think we, you know, yeah. we were going to be doing something those days. So, uh, so why not do something that 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 could go somewhere, right? You know, but I, I think the other key to this, uh, you know, gauging the market is it's easy for me to say because all these things did align very well, right? And we, we happened to hit upon something that was that was just going to take off. But it's also just being very honest with yourself and, and sober and, and just empirically looking at what response you get and judging that carefully, right? And I, I honestly think that if we didn't see the results we saw, you know, we just wouldn't, you know, clearly wouldn't, we wouldn't have kept doing it if it was, if it was even questionable, you know, we weren't were going to spend a lot of time. Yeah, we didn't quit our day jobs. Yeah. Uh, so how, 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 long. how long was it? Like, how, what was that period like? How long did it take for the the product to kind of really hit some critical mass where you were like, oh, okay, we can throw in the job now and focus on this? Five years. Five years. You know, I, I think, I, I think uh, probably we were really conservative about that. Yes. I think others might have done it a lot sooner, <laughs> but, but we just very much, we weren't, you know, real risk takers in that regard. You know, we're both high earners, right? You know, he's a game developer. I'm a doctor. We make good money in our day jobs mm-hmm. so why would we give that up for a hobby uh, unless the hobby was going to make more money and be sustainable and something that we can actually depend on and live on long term right and so that's so it really depended on the product making more money than we did in our day jobs and it you know there was some lead time in that our, our threshold for letting those day jobs <laughs> go was pretty high but, yeah but it worked out it worked out it, well, clearly it worked out. And I, I just want to kind of digress for a second and go into the psychology um, of, you know, being an entrepreneur. Like, I mean, it, it sounds, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like this was almost a bit of an accidental sort of, you know, digression down a side road that ended up being, you know, the main journey, right? But I'm interested in, like, were, were either of, or both of you, did you... Uh, sort of maybe foresee this in your future that you might go down this path were you always kind of a, you know, sort of entrepreneurial by nature were you were you tinkerers you know a lot of entrepreneurs start out yeah. as tinkering and you know putting things together and playing with different things you know like is, is, is that where you guys came from yeah we were always uh, floating things here or there right but i i just say it just didn't come from a uh from a place of extreme risk taking right yeah. we, we we wanted to find something that we knew would be solid yeah, I, I would say he's definitely a tinkerer. Uh, he's constantly inventing new things. You know, we, we've got gadgets around the house that just have one purpose. <laughs> yeah, and the tragedy is you have to be really disciplined once you find something successful, or even when you're trying to grow something, you have to really put the effort into that thing if you do believe it's going to be successful. So there's always a bit of a tension there. Yeah. And now another word from our sponsor. Hi, it's Ben again from WebBuzz, the growth marketing agency. I mentioned earlier in the show how we've developed a buy now, pay later digital marketing solution for small businesses. If you want to grow but cash flow is holding you back, WebBuzz offers you a way to invest in marketing with no interest and nothing to pay for up to three months. It's a simple five-step process and here's how it works. Number one, book a video meeting with our team. Two, choose a digital marketing package. Three, apply online for funding. Four, get approved. Five, start your campaign with zero dollars to pay up front. You can use it for lead generation, content, branding, SEO, or social media campaigns. Our buy now, pay later digital marketing is just the thing you need to get sales flowing again. So get that life is good feeling back in your business. Go to webbuzz.com.au slash bnpl. That's webbuzz.com.au slash BNPL and download a free info pack to learn more. So the problem we set out to solve in this episode was how to validate your product idea and avoid creating a money pit that destroys your life. Our product design experts, Carrie Peters from Us2 and Ross Gales from Pollen, revealed the theory behind effective product validation – and why it's such an important step for all businesses to take. And we've also heard some real-life stories from our entrepreneur guests, Mina at Different, Sven at the Speakeasy Group, and of course, 
uh, Wei Xin and Jason at Sleep Phones. I hope their wisdom and insights have given you ideas to crack the code to growth in your own venture. Now, as you can tell, product validation is super important. For me, there are three conclusions that we can all take from this episode. Number one, identify your assumptions. Every product idea is actually a hypothesis of human behavior that is based on a range of assumptions. You need to map these assumptions first before you can then validate or not. Number two, test and measure so you can fail fast. Get the data and use the frameworks to thoroughly test your assumptions. It's okay if you're wrong, and it's better to fail fast rather than waste a small fortune on building a white elephant. Number three, if all else fails, consider the f**k yeah principle. I loved Sven's approach, but this should only be used where conventional validation methods are unavailable. If you can use Facebook ads to validate like Mina suggested, do it. Don't use Sven's approach as a lazy cop-out. It's simply too dangerous. In the case of sleep phones, although Jason and Wei Xin admit to not doing any formal validation, it's equally clear they were getting positive signals from their users right from the early days. These formed the basis of an informal validation process, which was crucial to their success. They themselves said they would not have progressed the venture without it. The brutal truth is that some or perhaps even most product ideas don't deserve to live. But history is littered with the broken dreams of founders and investors brought down by a kind of group self-deception that their idea will conquer all. Product validation is a much needed dose of reality against the overhyped excitement that can cloud judgment in early stage ventures. If you're an entrepreneur or business owner, you owe it to yourself and your family to do due diligence on any idea that may well dominate your life for years to come. We're coming to the end, but before we go, it's time for our regular segment, Nerd Under Pressure, where a guest has to share one killer hack or tip they recommend for you, our listeners. Let's find out who our Nerd Under Pressure is today. Okay, Mina from um, PropTech company different. Uh, we now come to a regular segment of ours called Nerd Under Pressure. So it's Nerd Under Pressure and today Mina, you are the prop tech nerd. You're the um, property management technology digital nerd and we're really asking for one killer hack um, for our listeners around product development and in particular as it relates to validating your product idea, I'm going to give you five seconds of thinking time. Okay, over to you. Okay, so again, I think I'm going to go back to um, pen and paper here. So this is going to assume that you've established that your idea is actually a good one. And that's where my, my that's my Facebook ad killer. That's my killer hack. That was a killer hack, yep. Um, pen and paper, it's like, oh my God, bring out your arts and crafts child, right? Like I use my kids like kind of like stickers and things sometimes, just like actually like cut out pieces of paper, especially when I'm doing mobile development to give people a sense of what it's like to actually play with something there. And I, I think that the tactile nature of like picking, touching, pressing, especially when you're building a mobile app, makes a huge difference. So that, that's my, that's my one for product validation. That's fantastic. Thank you. That's great. So, I mean, maybe we can take that a step further and we can actually say to our listeners, look, uh, to, to sort of save on the arts and craft, go out and procreate, have children first. Then you've got the arts and craft <laughs> just lying around the house, nice and handy. Um, fantastic. So thanks for listening to episode 14 of the Nerds of Business podcast. If you've enjoyed it, Please leave a review on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. It helps us climb up the ranks and become more visible to other people. Remember, we want to help as many entrepreneurs and businesses as possible. If you've got a question or some feedback, we'd love to hear from you. You can engage with us at webbuzz.com.au forward slash nerds. That's webbuzz.com.au forward slash nerds. So, feel free to reach out and say hello. I want to thank all of our guests and the team at WebBuzz for helping me put this show together. We'll be back in two weeks with our next episode, which is product planning. How to develop your idea into a real thing people can actually buy. Until then, I'm your host, Darren Moffat, 
and I look forward to nerding out with you next time. Bye for now.